everybody. Good to be here. I hope you guys are doing well um, this Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening comfort, I'm saying what it is in my mind, is trying to help provide comfort for whatever you're going through. Of course, it started with the pandemic and then a number of things that followed the pandemic, shutdowns and um, riots and loss of jobs and people with um, really serious um, things are facing loved ones who are sick with COVID. Um, so it's to provide hope, encouragement, to help you um, get through this, to help me get through this. There's a certain sense that if I prepare for this, it helps me um, as well. And I was going to share that, you know, I don't have everything figured out. Um, <laughs> there's that halo effect going on again, which distracts me. Um, the, the fact that I'm a therapist just means that I um, have tools. This is what I do for a living. I study, I read, I try to practice, I listen, um, I share. But I can be afflicted with the same kind of things that you're afflicted with. I can have unexpected news. I could have hardships. I could have people pass away. I could have difficult decisions. And I think it's important to know that. Like I can have anxiety. I can have um, depressed mood. I can have um, panic attacks. I was going to show this. The thing is, I kind of know what to do with it. So I had helped people for many years with panic disorder. I thought I knew what anxiety was until I actually had a panic attack. And it's like, oh my Lord, help me. So I became much more effective, I would say, by having had panic attacks. Now, was I as panicked? I don't want to play word games, but was I as panicked as I could have been? Actually, no, because I knew it was a panic attack. I had so heard other people talk about it, had read about it, and knew what to do. So it, it actually preempted them from being worse. But what taste I had of them was enough to make me go, I am motivated. You know, you feel like you're going to lose your mind. Um, in my case, I thought, well, there's my career ending with um, the counseling. What a way to end. Um, it was from not learning to take care of myself. I was working too much. I was working on websites until about 2 in the morning and had a crisis at church, which then I started to get over fixated on. And it was probably years in coming really. Um, and then I learned to not have them anymore. I mean, that's for sure, because I became motivated. I read more. I practiced more. It did not help to read alone. I mean, some books were great. I, I liked a book called From Panic to Power. That's Panic to Power by Lucinda Bassett. In fact, I would almost jokingly pretend to be a voice advertising her program that was on the radio. Hi, my name's Lucinda Bassett. I struggle with anxiety for years. And I go, oh, yeah, for, if you call this number, you can have this program that can help you too. In fact, um, I'd say probably three people said it changed their life. So I knew about it. I was at a um, used bookstore, saw the book for $3 said, I should probably have this, put it on my shelf. And I'd say about four or five years later, ended up reading it when I had my panic attacks. And it was so helpful, so valuable. How, why was it helpful? Um, it just seemed to be what I needed to hear at the right time. She's a lay person. So she doesn't come at this from a clinical model. Um, I loved it. In fact, then I decided to, on eBay, buy her program for about $250, got it about half off. Um, it turns out everything in that was in the book. 
So as a therapist, I recommend the book. If you feel like you need a video to talk to you or an audio to listen to, that's okay. In fact, I have it. I'd probably sell it. Um, that's not a bad idea for some people. But everything I share as a therapist, it comes from her. There were... Well, I'll show this. Um, there were... It's weird. She really had it bad. And she overcame it. And she wrote in such a way that made you really think. Um, she says, I'm going to share with you. I'll share two principles from the book. Um, she said, if you <laughs> struggle with anxiety and panic, you are special. And it's like, oh, how sweet. I, I will admit when reading this, it's like, okay, she's just trying to be sweet here. It's funny, I should just keep a more open mind. I have probably a more open mind by God's grace than I did back then and try not to prejudge things, you know. Prejudice really doesn't usually help. But at the time, I said, okay, three things. She said, here they are. One is you're more intelligent than a lot of people um, because you think and think and think and think and think and you know too much for your own good you know about all those diseases out there you're smart enough to think about the future and to worry about what happens if this happens and then that happens it's like a very um, complicated flow chart lots of little avenues where we know people that don't have anxiety they're just a few it's this or this and they don't complicate things two you are sensitive and it's like well that kind of stuck in my heart yeah I feel more intelligent than the average person and I do feel sensitive yeah I pick up on things like earthquake mild earthquakes a sense I can smell a mile away I take things pretty sensitively. Hopefully that helps me be a, a better therapist. And then the last one is you're creative. And it's like, oh wow, that kind of hits me as well. I almost went into art um, institute rather than therapy. So what's interesting is these three things, which are gifts to people, often, if misused, become the problem. And I like that because once you realize I have yet to run into someone who struggles with anxiety in a big way that doesn't have all three of those. Sometimes there's just two, but it's actually not that bad. Take out the creativity part. And you may just feel really anxious and scared, but add creativity and then a person, person starts to self-doubt. Like, what if I do something bad? What if I hurt someone? What if there's still germs on this handle of the door? I mean, they really start to go overboard. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about body-oriented recovery and comfort. I, I've spoken before about a book called You Must Relax by Edmund Jacobson. He was a brilliant doctor, just brilliant, who um, back in the 1920s was discovering muscle tension in just the slightest of way. He actually worked with Bell Telephone Laboratory, so Bell Telephone it goes all the way back there, on what I would call today the electromyograph that measures muscle movement. And I point to the jaw because he had tiny, tiny little needles that can measure the tiniest of brain waves. Let's see if there's something in here in this book. Um, I actually don't have the book. I thought I would. But he was a pioneer. And he said, he noticed... This may not come out too good, but he did a lot of work. That's what it looked like. And so I do EEG biofeedback. He would have people hooked up to wires. 
And he would have them just think of saying something. Not moving their mouth, just think of saying something. Microscopic muscle movements. So then uh, there are other exercises where just think of being angry at someone. You can see where this is going. And there would be chronic tension there. I work with chronic tension or muscle tension every day with neurofeedback. We're not training for muscle tension to go down, but it seems that that's one of the things we do a lot to nicely now relax the jaw. Um, I've had a nurse when I was going in to have a surgery, she so say, now if you should have some really bad pain, relax the jaw like this. And it actually helps release some endorphins, she said. And, and most of you know that I'm a believer in Christ. And I heard some holy people say, well, in a book, they said it. If we truly trusted Christ, we would not have a tense muscle in our body. Say that again, if we truly surrender to God or let go entirely to put our life in God's hands, we wouldn't have a tense muscle. If you notice children, they're very non-muscle holding. I mean, they don't hold tension in their shoulders. They don't carry the weight of the world on their backs. They just don't. Uh, maybe that's what it means to be a, um, you know, a child and to become like a little child and to be carefree that way. So Edmund Jacobson wrote a book, You Must Relax, and shows you the sign of the times. It's an astounding book because it really talks about the stress in the 1920s with the invention of the streetcar and things are moving so fast and buses the book is 50 years in reprint, so the version I had was 1962, I believe, the year I was born. And they're talking about the stress of the world in terms of missile crises, the Cold War. It wasn't 62, it was later. He says, can you imagine this, that people, he's really concerned with nervous tension that uh, youth are listening to the radio while doing their homework. And this idea of doing two things at once would be too stimulating. Dr. Jacobson learned so well how to relax that, <laughs> this sounds creepy, but someone said he looked like a corpse when he relaxed. He was able to relax the body so much. I'm, I'm wondering if we started to practice this. It's a practice to just sit and relax. And there's exercises. I have posted one on my YouTube channel. You can look for it. You see me lying down there. So that's an obvious clue. And the idea is I move my hand up and I drop it. Now, people misunderstood what Edmund Jacobson was about in terms of progressive relaxation. And I did. For years, I just thought, okay, you just do these exercises. You tense up, then you let go. You tense up, then you let go. And you do this slower. And I did this before I went to bed. And it worked nicely. It actually worked. He didn't defend this, but another writer, David Wise, who wrote a book called Paradoxical Relaxation, says people misunderstood that. And so I went and got the book, and it's true. He wanted you to practice this relaxation over two or three months. He says on day one, all you do is you go up like this and you go like that. And he says, feel the tension in the, the whatever tension you feel of just the muscle movement. And then it goes limp, which sounds funny. It's actually funny doing this. Um, what he wanted you to experience is effort 
and non-effort. And it's hard to describe it, but it's an important thing to learn in life. To be able, we already know effort, but not efforting. Now we could use words like let go, and it's like, okay, I'm gonna let go, and it doesn't work that way. It's the absence of doing something. It's giving up. I, I witness this a lot working with addicts where they get so down, they're done. They have nothing more to give. They can't try any harder to stay sober. They're just done. And so they just let go. And that's when the spiritual miracle happens is by the letting go of control. So I do like this exercise. I think it's really important to, um, to experience. Um, I want to read something from his book. Um, I do believe that God, Providence, helps me know what to read when. Just like I shared about grabbing the book um, Panic the Power by Lucinda Bassett, about a year ago in June, I discovered the book, well, I had it on my shelf, Paradoxical Relaxation, which then led me to, and that was on a plane to New York, which I was not thrilled about going to. My wife needed help. I was, I was happy about that in New York for cancer, but um, I'd been there before, noise, not, I say not nice people. This was the attitude I was going into it with. Turns out I read this book on the plane, was like jumping up and down with joy, realizing that, that God was starting to work in understanding this paradoxical relaxation where you cannot make yourself relax and so many dear people who are scared to death or frightened or depressed say eric help help and they're so holding on come on i've got to make this go away i got to make this go away it doesn't work that way and i understand i can't pry their fingers off and say come on let go you can do it i know you can do it no that just gets weirder you just encourage them to move towards the direction of non-efforting so by the way when i got in new york i was not so tense i didn't have much muscle pain I was sitting in Central Park. I was doing a YouTube video on this. You can actually watch that as well. I was actually quite amazed of what I was experiencing. And I was actually quite happy. It was like a breakthrough. Little did I realize that it would lead me to three or four more books and then about 10 books on the mind-body syndrome. So. That's how things work a lot of times, is you don't have all the answers right at once. It just comes in small pieces. So I ordered this book, and I'm now reading this book again. Um, and I wanted to... Okay, it's not in this book. So I'm reading another book, which I've already read. This is an old book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, by Dale Carnegie. Some of you probably have heard of How to Win Friends and Influence People. Same guy. I was such a lonely child, and I did struggle with this. And I think my relatives, my grandmother specifically, had this book, and so it was sent down to me. Read it. The first one helped a lot. It's strangely, it's strange that these do work. And it's so weird to see how they apply to today. Um, it's shocking. Like this book will talk about insulin and how nervous tension is going to cause problems in our health. Uh, Edmund Jacobson in that You Must Relax book says, and this was just, it was hard to put down and not laugh. 
He says people are so stressed now that when they're eating, they're not able to digest their food and they mistakenly think they have an allergy to the food. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is gluten sensitivity. Now I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it just makes you wonder how did all these people instantly get sick? It could be, and then if they're told they're gluten sensitive, and then when they're frightened to eat something with gluten in it, it just makes it worse. I do think there's a pesticide part in all that, but it makes me wonder, are we really relaxed when eating? What are we looking at? Are we looking at YouTube? Are we looking at our phones? Do we give ourselves time to relax? This book, um, I'd say 80% of the stories talk about how anxiety was manifested in these people. And they, um, it was so about the nerves, that nerves were tired. It was called neurasthenia, stomach ulcers, skin and bones. And a lot of this happened during the World War II. And um, let's see when this was published. Um, I should say 1944, 45, 46, 47, and 48. So this was 1948. Um, I'm looking for this quote. And I guess it's not here, it's from another book. But it said that during World War II, so many soldiers were killed, but there were two million heart attacks during that time, and one million was from stress. And this was written a long time ago. This was like during the time. So even back then, they knew that people just from the stress and anxiety that one million got a heart attack from it. And I think what became clear to me is how many of us are getting sick without knowing that we're, I guess use the word in danger for getting sick just because of the stress of the pandemic, the lockdowns, the political division in this country, the riots, the lawlessness. Um, people are increasingly impatient because it's having an effect on everybody. Just chronic stress. What will happen? Are, are people gaining weight? Are, are there people struggling with insulin problems because they're um, getting insulin resistant because they're too stressed. Dr. Jacobson cites this amazing study that was unusual in that during the Korean War there were autopsies of a lot of young soldiers. So they were in their 20s and 30s and I think he is high as 70%, maybe 80, I think. A lot, we'll just say a lot of them had arteriosclerosis, meaning narrowing of the arteries from cholesterol and fat. And he makes it clear that he's going to get flack from people on this. But he says, look, their diet was healthy. Um, in that they're eating army diet, they're getting exercise, but what was going on, they had the beginnings of heart disease or had heart disease. They died from being shot at, but they had heart disease. I think it's a really important study. Now, interestingly enough about Edmund Jacobson, and I like him, he's a little bit wordy, as if that, it's funny, I'm kind of wordy, but he goes on off to a thing about the role of diet and a lower fat diet he thinks is a good idea. And he says, I'm just going to continue that until research can prove this. And he was writing this in the 1920s. Okay, so early on. Oh, so it was written originally in the 20s, but the version I had was 1960s. 
So he kept on adding data to that re revision. Um, so he's pointing out that sitting and relaxing, letting your mind not have to think, could actually help stress. Yeah, it can. So we have, let's, let's move ahead here. So I, there's a, something I wanted to read. You will hear about Sir William Osler, um, O-S-L-E-R, Osler, or Osler. Sir William Osler um, was so famous in terms of a doctor. Now he may not be famous to us, but um, he organized the world famous John Hopkins School of Medicine. He became Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, the highest honor that can be bestowed upon any medical man in the British Empire. He was knighted by the King of England. When he died, two huge volumes containing 1,466 pages was written about his life. His name, it says, was Sir William Osler. There are 21 words that he read in the spring of 1871. So it shows you the time frame. So 1871. He read this from the famous uh, writer Thomas Carlyle that helped him lead a life free from worry. Quote, our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Now that's a really good quote. Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. So this is taking one day at a time. This is focusing on what's right in front of me, not what some dim thing that could scare me to death or what's going to happen in the future. Um, he says, 42 years later, on a soft spring night, when the tulips were blooming on the campus, this man, Sir William Osler, addressed the students of Yale University. He told those Yale students that a man like himself, who had been a professor in four universities and had written a popular book, was supposed to have the brains of a special quality. He declared that that was untrue. He said that his intimate friends knew that his brains were of the most mediocre character. What then was the secret of his success? He stated that it was owing to what he called living in day-tight compartments. What did he mean by that? A few months before he spoke at Yale, Sir William Osler had crossed the Atlantic on a great ocean liner where the captain, standing on the bridge, could press a button and presto, there was a clanging of machinery and various parts of the ship were immediately shut off from one another shut off into watertight compartments. Now each one of you, Dr. Osler said to those Yale students, is much more marvelous organization than the great liner and bound on a longer voyage. What I urge you, what I urge is that you learn to control the machinery as to live with daytight compartments as the most certain way to ensure safety on the voyage. Get on the bridge and see at that least the great bulkheads are in working order. Touch a button and hear at every level of your life the iron doors shutting on the past, the dead yesterdays. Touch another and shut off with the metal curtain the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you're safe, safe for today. Shut off the past. Let the dead past bury its dead. Shut out the yesterdays, which are lighted fools, the, which have lighted fools the way to dusty death. The load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday carried today make the strongest falter. I love this writer. 
the load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter. Shut off the future as tightly as the past. The future is today. There is no tomorrow. The day of man's salvation is now. Waste of energy, mental distress, nervous worries, dog the steps of the man who is anxious about the future. Shut close then the great four and apt bulkheads and prepare to cultivate the habit of life of day tight compartments. Did Sir William Osler mean to say that we should not make any effort to prepare for tomorrow? No, not at all. But he did go on in that address to say that the best possible way to prepare for tomorrow is to concentrate with all your intelligence, all your enthusiasm, on doing today's work superbly today. That is the only possible way you can prepare for the future. Sir William Osler urged the students at Yale to begin the day with Christ's prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. And he goes on to say, you know, remember the prayer asks only for today's bread. It doesn't complain about the stale bread we had to eat yesterday. And it doesn't say, oh God, it has been pretty dry out there in the wheat belt lately, and we may have another drought, and then how will I get bread to eat next fall? Or suppose I lose my job, oh God, how can I get bread then? goes on. He talks about the Bible verse, take no thought for tomorrow. And he clarifies, he says thought doesn't mean just thinking. Although I would go far as to say we need to think less and be in our bodies and our heart more. But thought means anxious. If I think I need to pay my taxes tomorrow, that's not a bad thought. Um, but so many of our thoughts are really not necessary. Um, uh, Patrick McEwen, K-E-O-W-N, I like him. He's an Irishman who struggled with asthma and anxiety for many years, and he then learns how through breathing through the nostrils, close your mouth. He talks a lot about mouth breathing. But he says our thoughts... We may have about 50, 55,000 thoughts, and most of them don't really, aren't necessary. If I think I need to pay my taxes or I need to um, take the car in for an oil change, you know, that's a useful thought, or I should pray now, or um, I wonder what I'm going to eat. That's kind of on the border. Um, thoughts that are practical, like, I need to get the instructions to be able to put this table together. But how many of us think thoughts that are just useless? And if there was a video or some documentary or some device that could really show all the thoughts, like, wow, why did she wear that sweater? Boy, it's cold in here, which is um, air conditioning. I hear a car zooming. Um, today, to get current I had a dental appointment. I did um, you know, my walk. As I'm stepping out the door, and I had done my um, glucose reading, which was higher than I wanted it to be. I'm not a diabetic, but I'm, I'm thinking it's not a bad idea to check my blood sugar just to see what's going on there. Can't control the blood sugar per se directly, but I thought, okay, I'll step out. I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and I always tend to be cold. See, that sounds like a negative thought. But um, I step out and walk down to the lake, which is about two miles. Um, I'm cold, but I had thoughts that, I mean, there were thoughts like I should go back, get some more clothes. I said, Eric, you're fine. I thought, it's fine. And so I, I'm trying to ignore the thoughts and be in the moment. And it's okay to be cold. See, we have so many thoughts that it's the thoughts that disturb us, really. Um, I'm going to do something different here.
I'm trying to get away from this look like I have some halo. Um, and there's a thought that was probably not useful. Um, the long story short is, I, as I'm walking down, I just try to become more sensory. Just notice the fog, notice the lighting. I could feel my muscles begin to warm up. I could feel what felt to be pounding of my feet on the pavement as I'm going down a hill. I began to feel the sunlight on my face. And I did have a thought, oh, this will be nice. It will be warmer. Uh, but see, I could be walking down and thinking negative, negative, negative. If I let myself, I could be thinking of, oh, that blood sugar was high. What's going to happen? Well, I have enough time. I had to go to the dentist. I go down. So, but uh, no, I was just trying to be an, and by the way, your chemistry can be so used to this that that's what you do. It's such a habit that it's a hard habit to break, but it's a, it's a good habit to break. To weigh, to weigh, the way to move away from trying not to do something is to do something else. If I said, let's not think of a mask. Do not think of the mask. Do not notice any colors in the mask. Do not notice the straps of the mask. All that's happening is it just it, it, it directs you to that. You, it's impossible. Our brains are set up that way. And if we want to go a little bit biblical, which is fascinating, um, in the epistles, St. Paul is saying that he would not know what it meant to sin if the law didn't say, do not covet. He would have no concept of it. We wouldn't have any concept, perhaps, of any cleanliness if there weren't any cleanliness laws. So it kind of programmed us. So when it uses thou shalt not murder, it's what kind of helps us know that we don't want to do that. The problem is, if we just try not to murder people or try not to be angry, we get more stuck in it. If I'm trying not to be fearful, just try not to be fearful. Don't try to find yourself short of breath or heart palpitations or muscle tension. That's all you're focused on. So the brain's so directional, you kind of come over here, just come over here. So let's talk about peace. Let's talk about what it's like to unload a burden. Let's, type, let's look at what it's like to be relaxed and calm and happy um, and just distract yourself over here. I'll remember in my training, um, children, like little babies, learn, since I'm using this, they learn to hold on before they learn to let go. It makes sense. You don't see them let go and put something down. It just doesn't work that way. You, ha you dangle something, and they go, oh, yeah, and they hold on to it. So how are you ever going to get them? And if you try to, come on, give it to me, they don't let go. And this is fun to play with. If you hand them this, they let go to grab that. So this has stuck with me as a metaphor that we can't let go of our addiction, our fear, our depression, just by trying to let it go. It's like we're babies that way. What we have to have offered to us is some, this is a nice coaster. We have to hold on to something better. And we'd say that's God. We'd say that that's better way to thinking, um, comfort. Yeah, yeah, comfort. There's a reason why I didn't call this the Tuesday night COVID comfort hour because COVID just, we don't need those words to have it describe what we need. And I want it to be timeless so that it can help us in some other way. So day tight compartments is really a boundary. It sets a limit saying, I'm not going to think about anything in the future. I'm not going to think about the past. I'm just going to focus right on the here and now. 
That is where we meet God. That is where we're more body-centered. If I'm doing this and then relaxing, hopefully I'm focusing on feeling the sensations of the muscles instead of worrying about, I've got to get rid of the panic. No, that's not how this works. I'm working on letting go and non-effort. And... Um, it's not that we don't work and struggle in the kingdom of God, but verses that support this idea is be still and know that I am God. And I think some of the translations or the wording is be stop moving. Be quiet. Acquire inner stillness by just not Doing. And these are practices. They're, they're called a practice because you're continuing to get better one day at a time. That's why I like the term practicing therapy. Um, the joke is, oh, you're just practicing. Well, I don't practice on me. But no, it's a practice. It's, you're never totally skilled at it. You, you're, you're a continuous learner. Um, and good case in point would be when I had helped people with panic disorder and after I got panic disorder and overcame that by God's grace, I was better skilled to help people. I feel bad about the people before, but it is what it is. And I realized, I think I worked with a lot severe panic disorders after I got them. It seems like Thankfully, God in his wisdom allowed me to go through something first so that then I would have a better understanding of what people are going through. But not always. I've worked with people for years and helping. Um, I heard about what it's like going through situations with parents that are elderly and you have to help move them into a different living situation. And now that I'm going through that myself, it's a different experience. I kind of know what things to look out for by hearing what other people's stories are. Yep. This book is um, worth buying, but it's also on YouTube. I think it's five hours or maybe even longer read. And it works. It, I, I think either way, it's really something to to listen to. And a lot of, when I listen to it on YouTube, it saves where I, I left off. Yeah. Um, story after story after story of people getting better. Um, like the perfect way to conquer worry, how my mother and father conquered worry. You now, so he talks about his own life. And then it summarizes it. Um, it says rule number one, let your our minds fit our let our let's fill our minds with thoughts of peace, courage, health, and hope. For our life is what our thoughts make it. Rule two boy, um, my poor speech. Rule two let's never try to get even with our enemies, because if we do, we will hurt ourselves far more than we hurt them. Let's do as General Eisenhower does. Let's never waste a minute thinking about people we don't like. Yeah, he quotes a lot of famous people. People, he encouraged people to write in to do this. <clears throat> he actually wanted to teach this class at the YMC, you know, at a college. The college rejected him, and so I think he taught it at the YMCA, if I, my memory serves me correctly. And it turns out there was such an astounding, um, lots of people came. It, it was, an, um, so then he writes a book. Uh, instead of worrying about ingratitude, let's, ex um, let's expect it. Let's remember that Jesus healed 10 lepers in one day and only one thanked him. Why should we expect more gratitude than Jesus got? 
good. Yeah, that's true. Let's expect ingratitude. Let's remember the only way to find happiness is not to expect gratitude, but to give for the joy of giving. Count your blessings, not your troubles. Some of these are old, like when fate hands a lemonade, a lemon, let's try to make lemonade. But they're still pretty good. And I was amazed at how many of the stories relate to health, like insulin problems and weight gain or weight loss. In fact, I'm going to read this. This kind of reminded me. Um... Yeah, this was good. Um, so he gets the privilege of interviewing Arthur Hayes Salzberger, publisher of one of the most famous newspapers in the world, the New York Times, okay, at the time. Probably things have changed. Um, this was Second World War flamed across Europe. He was so stunned, so worried about the future that he found it almost impossible to sleep. He would frequently get out of bed in the middle of the night, take some canvas and tubes of paint, look in the mirror, and try to paint a portrait of himself. He didn't know anything about painting, but he painted anyway to get his mind off his worries. Mr. Salzberger told me that he was never able to banish his worries and find peace until he had adopted as his motto five words from a church hymn, one step enough for me. Lead kindly light, keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. You know, mottos are important. Short phrases are really important because they're short they will stick in your mind and you can use them as a little weapon when it comes to battle. One step enough for me. I do not ask to see the distant scene. Just one step enough for me. That would be faith. Um, in 1980, no, 1945, April, Ted Bengarimo, Benger, Ben Ger Germano, Ben Germano, um, Ben Germano said, I had worried until I had developed what doctors called a spastic traverse colon, colon, a condition that produced intense pain. If the war hadn't ended when it did, I am sure I would have ended up having a complete physical breakdown. I was utterly exhausted. I was a Graves Registration Non-Commissioned Officer for the 94th Infantry Division. My work was to help set up and maintain records of all men killed in action, missing in action, and hospitalized. I also had to help disinter the bodies of both Allied and enemy soldiers who had been killed and hastily buried in shallow graves during the pitch of battle. I had to gather up the personal effects of these men and see that they were sent back to parents or closest relatives who would prize these personal effects so much. I was constantly worried for fear we might be making embarrassing and serious mistakes. I worried about whether or not I would come through all this. I I was worried about whether I would hold, live to hold my only child in my arms, a son of 16 months whom I had never seen. I was so worried and exhausted that I lost 34 pounds. I was so frantic that I was out, almost out of my mind. I looked at my hands. They were hardly more than skin and bones. I was terrified at the thought of going home a physical wreck. I broke down and sobbed like a child. I was so shaken that tears welled up every time I was alone. There was one period soon after the Battle of the Bulge started that I wept so often 
that I almost gave up hope of ever being a normal human being again. There's something really powerful about reading this. Like, whoa, I thought I had the problems that I had. And who does that work of what he described, having to take care of the dead bodies or um, all that stuff? It just shows you that doing that kind of work over and over can cause issues. It wears your nervous system out. It just does. So we're going to learn what happened. I ended up in an army dispensary. An army doctor gave me some advice which had completely changed my life. After giving me a thorough physical examination, he informed me that my troubles were mental. Ted, he said, I want you to think of your life as an hourglass. You know there are a thousand grains of sand in the top of the hourglass and they all pass slowly and evenly through the narrow neck in the middle. Nothing you or I could do would make more than one grain of sand pass through this narrow neck without impairing the hourglass. You and I and everyone else are like this hourglass. When we start in the morning, there are hundreds of tasks which we feel that we must accomplish that day. But if we do not take them one at a time, and let them pass through the day slowly and evenly, as do the grains of sand passing through the narrow neck of the hourglass, then we are bound to break our own physical or mental structure. Cool. I have practiced that philosophy ever since that memorable day that an army doctor gave it to me, one grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. The advice saved me physically and mentally during the war, and it also helped me in my present position of public relations and advertising director for the Ad Crafters Printing and Offset Company, Incorporated. I found the same problems arising in business that had arisen during the war. A score of things had to be done at once, and there was little time to do them. We were low in stocks, we had new forms to handle, new stock arrangements, changes of addresses, opening and closing offices, and so on. Instead of getting taut and nervous, I remembered what the doctor had told me, one grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. By repeating those words to myself over and over, I accomplished my tasks in a most efficient manner and I did my work without the confused and jumbled feeling that had almost wrecked me on the battlefield. It goes on. It's a it's a great book. Anyway, I just feel that. Um, another book with pain and love. This is Elder Piesius now St. Paisius. Um, and how does this relate? Um, oh boy, I, okay. Good news is I think um, I'm gonna, Um, I just want to go back far enough in the book because I, I tend to read and then go oh, backwards. Um, he was saying the same thing. Um, too many worries make people forget God. Okay. Um, and this is page 218. Yuranda, and this is a, a term of endearment to someone who's a holy father. Do worries cause us to withdraw from God? Look, 
He says, when a little child is playing and is absorbed with his games, he is not aware that his father is sitting next to him, caressing him. The moment he stops playing, he realizes that he is being caressed. By the way, this is translated from Greek to English, so some of the words go, well, that we may not use the word caress, but it's an okay word to use. The moment he stops playing, he realizes that he is being caressed. Similarly, when we are pro preoccupied with too many worries or concerns, we cannot be aware of God's love. So, so the metaphor here is when a child is playing with the toy, you know, my father could be hugging me. Why don't we, we, we use that term? And he's sitting right next to me and, you know, I'm not aware of this touch because I'm so busy playing with the toys. The moment he stops playing with the toy, he noticed that he is being hugged or caressed. Similarly, when we are preoccupied with too many worries or concerns, we cannot be aware of God's love. I think this is really, really key. So many people struggle with, I don't feel God's love. And I think it's distorted thinking. Um, but I think that if I'm distracted by worries and cares, concerns, I cannot feel his crest on my shoulder. I can't experience him because I'm worrying. And um, God gives, but we do not sense it. Be careful not to waste your precious energy on superfluous concerns and needless things, which one day will surely turn to dust. Then bodily tired and with all your minds scattered aimlessly, at the hour of prayer you will offer to God your tiredness and your yawns like another king. Oh, wow. The result will be that your inner state will be that of the state of Cain with anxiety and sighs of discomfort initiated by the little devil standing by your side. We must not waste the fruit of our labors, the inner core of our souls in aimless pursuits and leave only the outer shells for God. The many cares of life sap the marrow from our hearts and leave nothing for Christ. When your mind constantly wanders off to various chores you have to do, you should realize that you are not doing well spiritually. I've been guilty of that. It's crazy. I get into the prayer corner. I'm looking forward to it. And then my mind goes off to, well, I should just do this quick. And I know that that's bad form. And then I'm tempted to think if I don't remember to do it now, I won't do it. And then I also know some saints have said, Whatever your distractions are is really an affront to God. So if it involves food, I'm hungry, then you can see I'm a glutton. If it involves work, then I'm just prideful. I have all these things more important than talking to God of the universe, asking him for help. Now, we shouldn't beat ourselves up in an unhealthy way, but we should encourage ourselves to go, I've got to, to be aware of what's going on. If the devil or the demonic energies try to get us not to even pray, then we're not even praying. But if we are praying, they're still going to try to get us distracted. So this is just how life is. When your mind constantly wanders off to various chores you have to do, you should realize that you're not doing well spiritually. You should worry then because this means that you have distanced yourself from God. You should realize that you have grown closer to material things than you have to God, closer to creation than to the Creator. Unfortunately, it is not uncommon for a monastic or a monk to be deceived and draw a worldly form of pleasure from his work. We know that it is in man's nature to do good because his Creator is good, but a monastic is striving to transform himself from a human being into an angel. And what they mean by that is not literally, but monastics, you know, it's natural to have a desire for the opposite sex and to want to build a family and a home and these kind of things. 
the monastic forgoes all that for a, a, a greater good, which is a life totally surrendered to God. It's not that our lives shouldn't be totally surrendered to God. It's just a different context. Um, Well, I think this is worth reading. Too much work and too many worries make monastic worldly. And again, we're trying to apply this to our lives. It is best for those who desire to live spiritual lives, especially monastics, to avoid pursuits or projects that will stand in the way of this goal. They should not take up too many projects because work never ends. If monastics do not learn inner spiritual work, they will look for an escape in all kinds of external activities. People consumed by endless tasks will end their lives with all kinds of spiritual imperfections. They will then repeat of their endless activity, but it'll be too late. Oh no, they will then repent of their endless activity, but it will be too late because their passport and destination will have already been issued. But in general, it is important to take a break from work, even if only for a little while. When we reduce the number of chores we have to do, it is natural that our bodies will feel rested and that a thirst for interior spiritual work, the work which consoles and never tires, will arise in us. So, the rest, I've been thinking a lot about how just 50 years ago, people really did take Sunday off. They went to church, and they did not do a lot of anything. Actually, 50 years, it's probably more closer to 70 now. Well, I think when I was a kid, gas stations were closed. But I do know that it was probably before that. We weren't just going, 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 going all the time. TV stopped at 11 o'clock. Now, we uh, this is an experiment. We get to see what life is like when we have constant work to do on our cell phones, on our computers. And I'm not, it sounds like I'm anti these things. I'm just pointing out that this is different than what our ancestors did. Um, When we reduce the number, um, of task, um, yeah, when we reduce the number of chores we will have to do, it is natural that our bodies will feel rested and that a thirst for interior spiritual work, the work which consoles and never tires, will arise in us. Then the soul will breathe an abundance of spiritual oxygen. Spiritual work never causes fatigue. Mm. Wow. I've got to write that down. Um, now, this is a spiritual saint, a man, a godly man, saying this. And I'm assuming that he's right and my thoughts are wrong on this, but I'm going to underline it to see. Um, Jesus did say that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He said, come learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. And um, I do think that there's some effort, but spiritual work never causes fatigue. Maybe tiredness is different than fatigue. On the contrary, it gives us rest and refreshment because it lifts us up on high and brings us closer to our loving Father before whom our souls rejoice. When physical labor does not have a spiritual reason, or to put it better, when physical labor does not have its basis in a spiritual need that justifies it, it brings out the worst out in us. Even the most tame and good-tempered horse, even the most tame and good-tempered horse, when overworked, will start kicking and showing a bad temper. 
despite the fact that horses normally become more gentle with age. Interesting. Um, the section I was actually looking for had to do with doing one thought, uh, one thing at a time, and not doing too much. Well, it says, when we work too hard and too fast, we get tired and distracted. This is bad for the spiritual life. Um, yeah. yeah. So, great book. Again, he says, try not to overdo um, too much. Um, the pain and love for contemporary man. And... Um, you just look it up, um, you'll find it. St. Paisius of Mount Athos. Well, um, speaking of tasks, I think this task should come to an end. Um, it's good to see you guys. Um, it's good to see that you're uh, benefiting from this. Um, if you have questions or things you would like to see more of, um, let me know. Um, I, I, I get a lot of these ideas from actually people I'm working with. So I wish you um, good um, rest, peace, um, taking one day at a time and wishing you the grace to be able to just lock things into tight compartments, not letting things seep in from one to another. So take care, my friends, and oh, we got a shout out from Tom Robinson's. Great. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tom, for that. Um, I wish you guys well, and um, have a good, blessed evening. Take care. Bye-bye. I'll, I'll put these books um, I think I should put books um, down in the um, comments. Take care. Yeah.